David, um, happy second day of the exchange, everyone. I know uh, it has been a jam-packed uh, agenda session. And I mean, I've been so inspired to see all the work and the collaborative presentations, everything from peace and justice to systems change and leading in times of disruption. And um, I see some people who are really eager to hear this keynote and I am as well to hear kind of words of hope and also um, kind of deep reflection on how we can build a better society together. And on that note, even before we start our keynote panel this afternoon and our introductions, I actually just wanted to start with an acknowledgement. Um, I think many, many of all of us today have, uh, didn't expect to have such a sad start to our day and our heads and hearts are with our friends from the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. There have just been senseless acts of violence and racism that are completely unacceptable and have no place in our society. You know, it's up to us as people and change makers to really rise up and to help stop this injustice. And so I'd like to ask everyone as you're filing in, you know, to take a moment in between the sessions and the conversations and the hope that we're all generating together um, to be with those who have been impacted by this and especially with um, our community members who are um, especially impacted to take a brief moment of silence in remembrance of those lives that were lost. Thanks everyone. And even transitioning from that, um, I would like to invite my uh, colleague and, and future panelist on the session today, Tessa. Um, if you could also join us in sharing some of your work that you've done with uh, schools and stress and anxiety to help us um, kind of reset and get ready for the session today. Thank you, Erin, for having me. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to start our time together with, ju with just a couple quick tools to help us get present um, and really center ourselves um, before the panel begins. So the first tool I'm going to share with you is called finger breathing. So a fun fact is that it takes seven deep breaths to calm the nervous system. And our finger breathing tool actually ensures we get 10. So I invite you to find a comfortable seat or stance whatever feels best for you, maybe take a couple shoulder shrugs if that feels nice. And then simply take a hold of your left thumb with your right hand. We're gonna take a really big inhale through our nose. Pause at the top, exhale out through your mouth. Now we're gonna to switch, take a hold of your right thumb with your left hand. A really big inhale through your nose. Pause, exhale out through your mouth. Now take hold of your left pointer finger, take a really big inhale through your nose, feel your chest rise and your belly expand. Pause, exhale out your mouth. Now take a hold of your right pointer finger, take a big inhale. Pause. Exhale through your mouth. Now take a hold of your left middle finger. Take a really big inhale through your nose. Pause. Exhale through your mouth. Now take a hold of your right middle finger. Take a big inhale. Pause. Exhale through your belly deflate. Now take a hold of your left ring finger. Take a really big inhale through your nose. Feel your chest rise and your belly expand. Pause. Exhale out through your mouth. Now take a hold of your right ring finger. Take that inhale once again. Pause. Exhale out through your mouth. Now take a hold of your left pinky finger. Take the biggest inhale of your day. How big can your inhale get? Pause. Exhale out through your mouth. 
And last but not least, take a hold of your right pinky finger and see if you can take an even bigger inhale. Pause. Exhale, let everything go. And I love that tool um, for the students in the room. That is actually the tool that got me through college. I think I did that in most of my lectures that I was in, um, especially if I knew a professor was likely to call on me. That was my go-to tool. Um, and last, I'll just invite to kick us off. If anyone is willing to share in the chat, what are three wins you can celebrate for today? What are three wins you've experienced? So for me, a win is always when I make my bed. A, win, a second wind of my day is that I, we've been interviewing for my team and we had some really good candidate interviews today. Um, and the third win is that I get to spend the next hour with Aaron Boyd, who is someone I admire so much. So type into the chat, what are three wins you've had today? Awesome, Jennifer. That's definitely a win. Thank you for sharing. Yes, Alexandra. I love these. I love these because we can also find other wins we've had throughout the day. Marina, good night, sleep, yes. Jen, I love the bounce to basketball in the sun with my son, that's awesome. Avery, congrats on submitting all your assignments today. Oh, yay, Aaron. Aaron, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your three wins. Thank you so much, Chessa. And now we're going to transition into this really wonderful conversation. And we'd like to begin the keynote by recognizing a close Ashoka U partner and sponsor of today's discussion, the Fetzer Institute. The Fetzer Institute believes in the possibility of a loving world, a world where we understand that we are all part of one human family and that we know our lives have purpose. In this world that Fetzer seeks, everyone is committed to courageous compassion and bold love, powerful forces for good in the face of fear, anger, division, and despair. So please join me in welcoming Xiao An Li, Senior Program Officer, Fetzer Institute, for an introduction to today's keynote titled, Who is Education For? Thank you, Erin. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know this is such a global event, but you're all welcome tonight. My name is Xiao An. I'm a Senior Program Officer at Fetzer Institute, which is a private foundation in Southwest Michigan. It's a very powerful global mission which is to help build a spiritual foundation for a loving world. Let me repeat, because they are very powerful yet intriguing. Spiritual foundation for a more loving world. It's so exciting and it got me you know, awake in, you know, uh, in the evening by just thinking about this mission. I love this mission personally because we were born into mystery and we really cannot escape the deep questions of existence and the human condition. Old or young, or parents or children, or college students in this case, we're all yearning for a life-affirming connection with transcendence and each other. A connection that really will give us the love, courage, and hope with which to build a life and to build a world together. I come to you with a saddened heart. You can tell I'm originally from China, from Asian American heritage. 
one of my friends was impacted. During a time as such as difficult as this, I will be most authentic to you. So my thoughts may be here and there, but I'm going to do my best. Ashoka U and the Feds Institute collaboration started five years ago. It's hard to imagine has been a good five years journey altogether. I remember the very first one was in, in Miami Dade College 2017 exchange. And that is so memorable, more, more than just because, uh, you know, just the first one, rather is the keynote. Some of you, if you ever attended, when we invited one of the most renowned scholars in higher education, Parker Palmer, and our CEO, Bob Boister, speaking on the importance of bringing the heart into higher education. What did they mean by that? What they meant by what you see in it in higher education setting, K to 12, as well as higher ed, in educational domain, you just see the overemphasis of the skills in the purpose of preparing for a job or to become one of the labor forces. You've seen enough of the overemphasis on and a lot of times on analytical, functional, and the technical skills. And you see a lot of separation of the head and the heart and the soul. Parker Palmer, I remember it during his speech talking about the soul is missing. There's a profound emptiness and there's a pain of disconnection. That stuck with me, resonated with me since then for a good five years. Well, since the first meeting in Miami Dade, we really collaborate further and want some wonderful content offerings and, and breakout sessions include, keep asking the question of why we're doing what we're doing as change makers. We have noticed enough of burnout and lack of well-being because we're so tacked into the mentality we are change making, so we are gonna go out to make a difference in the community. A lot of times, we overlook the needs to turn to our own well-being. So asking the deep question of why we're doing what we're doing, I would encourage this community to keep asking that question. Then during summer as such, as divisive as such, and we have worked very closely on many sessions, including a Fetzer scholarship on exam plus in university setting where they do everything they can to work across differences. It has been a five good year. And it just amazed me by also looking at, this is actually the 12 Ashoka Yu exchange. You know, I'm original from China. I, I love zodiac sign. You understand the zodiac sign comes as a circle every 12 years. So it is time for us to celebrate. We understand this is going to be our last one, but it's the beginning of something new. Let's celebrate the impact this community has achieved. And to amplify the impact of our change maker campuses, our, a lot of our grantees, universities, our partners, and our students. And I want to shout out to a couple of names over here and really working so closely with Marina, with Anne, with Bida, with Emily, and all those wonderful leaders. Please give them a round of applause for the wonderful effort creating this powerful community. Another point I want to share is this is a time for healing. Think about we are just less than five months away from the most polarizing national election in modern history. And one of the most divided time of our nation has just experienced. So it is more than ever, it will be critical for us all to, re to utilize the event this week and this powerful community as a force that brings people, all of us together to learn, to heal, and ultimately to flourish. It amazed me when I just reflect four years ago in Miami Day College. And that was also less than four months away from the 2016 presidential election. When we convened there, I found this community, this community I'm talking about here was reeling and that the exchange provide me personally both the comfort and the hope that I just needed
during that time. So history repeated itself, but what's not changed is the resilience, is the sense of hope that's within each and every one of us. Let's heal together. Let's, let's send all the condolences and, and thoughts to the families, the victims in Atlanta and beyond. It's, it's a platform for building the future. I, I, like I said, it's, it's the end, but it's also a new beginning. So I'm here to really invite all of us to work very closely with Ashoga You. It may take a different form, but let's all work together to co-create a form that works best for all of us. And in this case, I wanna wrap up this, this little portion by thank everyone for the wonderful partnership in the past and I wish this event a grand success. Particularly, I know we have a wonderful panel discussion that's coming up right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Xiao An. Um, what a wonderful intro and setting the tone, just the work of Fetzer Institute and everything that you stand for to set the tone for this panel. We're so grateful. And next, I'd like to introduce and invite Lauren Burroughs who's the Education and Inclusion Coordinator at Brantford Center for Student Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Wilfrid Laurier University. Lauren is a longtime leader in the Shokyu community and she was an inaugural member of the Exchange Council. So she helped to make sure that all the perspectives um, from the different institutions and different stakeholder experiences were actually brought into the Exchange agenda. We're so thrilled that she's gonna be moderating a discussion featuring the perspectives of four students and recent graduates on the future of higher education. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you, Erin, I appreciate that. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'll copy that intro. My name is Lauren Burroughs. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm an educator and activist within communities that are currently occupying the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Adewanderan peoples, and what is treaty land, the Hold'em and Tract. I'm starting today recognizing the land, uh, number one, to pay gratitude to these communities who have held a relationship with this land since time immemorial, uh, which, been, which means before our collective memory, but also as the first of many necessary actions that we must take in solidarity with indigenous peoples as an integral component of creating communities with the capacity for decoloniality, justice, and sustainability. I am so excited to moderate this keynote panel today entitled Who is Higher Education For? as we welcome to the Zoom stage an incredible group of discerning, compassionate panelists who will lead us through a dialogue on imagining the future of higher ed. We come together at a really pivotal time in our collective experience, uh, not only as we respond to the trauma of COVID-19 and its impacts, but also a period of change in which we are again reminded by land defenders and water protectors, activists, educators, artists, creators, frontline workers, change makers, and others, that we need to strengthen our muscles for futurist thinking. We need to ask ourselves how lessons from the past and present can emerge as practices of recovery towards racial, decolonial, gender, environmental, economic, reproductive, disability, and other forms of justice. Ask how we can create communities that are strengthened by our commitments to each other and the health of our future together, rather, just, rather than just a status quo particularly status quo of exclusion, violence, oppression, and injustice, and how we can reorient ourselves towards priorities that are generative and transformative, and then, <laughs> and then how we can find our roles in that labor to move towards those priorities. So as noted in our program, today's conversation is meant to disrupt the focus on operations and semantics and change-making in higher education, and calls us to ask and respond to the question, who is education meant to serve? and what orienting or reorienting ourselves towards diverse student experiences can mean for the future. We welcome current students and recent grads to reflect on their educational journeys, the challenges and barriers, and their hopes for the immediate and long-term future of change-making in higher ed. Uh, the plan for our hour together today includes 10-minute offerings from each of our panelists. Uh, then there'll be an opportunity for them to respond to each other, uh, and then we will open the floor up for questions and comments. Uh, however, uh, throughout, I encourage folks to share micro affirmations. Uh, micro affirmations are the opposite of microaggressions. And so they are comments and actions that affirm uh, folks' lived experiences and identities. And so I hope you're open to connecting uh, with our panelists today in that way. 
So I'm going to introduce each panelist prior to their offering. Uh, and so we'll start with the first panelist, uh, Tessa Zimmerman, who we've already met, who led us through that great breathing exercise, uh, who I feel like I could use another. <laughs> um, uh, Tessa Zimmerman is the founder of Asset Education, a nonprofit organization dedicated to teaching students how to mitigate stress in the present so they can build resilience for the future. In her debut book, I Am Tessa, she shares her personal story of growing up with anxiety and the tools to find joy in the challenging moments. Please join me, join me in welcoming our first speaker of the panel, Tessa Zimmerman. So welcome back, Tessa. Thank you, Lauren. I'll say, Lauren, that I love leading those tools because they help me calm down before like any speaking opportunity. Um, so thank you for having me tonight, everyone. So uh, a little context on me. Uh, I never thought I would actually go to college. I didn't think higher education was in the cards for me. And it was because I grew up having really severe anxiety and panic attacks in the classroom uh, since I was eight. So when I was eight years old, if my teacher asked me for a writing prompt or to answer a really simple math problem, I would erupt into a massive panic attack. And my teacher never really knew how to respond. And so she'd often send me to the principal's office or she'd hand me a stress ball. And neither really supported me in developing coping mechanisms or social and emotional skills to navigate my anxiety. So as I got older, my anxiety got progressively worse. Uh, I found myself at 13 years old sitting in front of a therapist that was really well respected in our community and had shared my experience with anxiety, my frequency of panic attacks. And this therapist says to me that I'm never gonna go to college and I'm gonna live at home for the rest of my life. And I remember feeling uh, so defeated and so embarrassed because here was this expert telling me that like my future wasn't even in the cards. But I was lucky enough that at the time I had just received a full scholarship to a private high school. And so I had the courage to go into the school building the next day and I beelined it straight to the school director's office. Um, her name is Mrs. Inwood. And uh, Mrs. Inwood, uh, I call, lovingly call her the child whisperer. Uh, she grew up with severe anxiety herself as did her daughter. So she really intimately knew anxiety. And I went into her office sobbing and shared what this therapist had told me. And the thing about Mrs. Inwood was she so deeply believed in every student that no matter what challenge you may experience that you can overcome it. Um, and she told me like, honey, you're gonna go to college. Like I'm, I'm gonna make sure of it. And so the first thing she did that was really profound for me and my ability to go to higher ed was she paired me up with her daughter, Jamie. See, Jamie had grown up with severe anxiety just like me. She had had panic attacks all her life, yet Jamie was in graduate school at Yale at the time. And Jamie was the first role model I had ever had who I knew had anxiety, who had had a similar lived experience to me. And so Jamie met with me for a year, almost like every Sunday. Uh, and we would go get tea at like the Barnes and Nobles like local bookshop and she would sit with me and share with me how to do things the anxiety way. So she taught me executive functioning skills, how to manage my time, how to organize myself, how to really set time limits on homework and all of these skills that would be really foundational for me when I got to college. So the first thing that really gave me hope that I could go to college and persevere was that I had someone that had a lived experience like mine and was doing it and was supporting me in my own process. And to this day, as an adult, I know I can still call on Jamie uh, when I need her, her support and her love. Uh, the second thing Mrs. Inwood really did that really enabled me to persevere and go to college and my high school principal, Mr. Quirk, they did this together as well is that they believed that stress and, not, and, and anxiety was inevitable. Like you were going to face stressors and challenges in your life. And whether you chose to go into directly into the workforce or you chose to go to a two-year college or a four-year college, you would face stress. 
And so they really made it a practice that they shared different coping strategies, like the finger breathing one we did earlier, every single day of the school year. Every single day, I learned a different way to cope with stress. And that's how my day started. So whether I was feeling like super good and super happy or super anxious, I began to practice social and emotional skills that would then become really natural and, and intuitive for me when I left their school experience. And I would say the last thing that they did that really enabled me to go to higher education and find my place within higher ed was that they believed that young people should explore their curiosities in high school. So when I was 15, I, for whatever reason, because I had grown up with anxiety and was starting to overcome it at the time, I was like, I really want to be a child neuropsychologist, or that's what like I walked into the school day with. And Mr. Cork was like, okay, let's like give you some experiences so you can get to feel like what that coursework might feel like and what it might be like in that role. And, and Mr. Cork had a background in psychology, luckily. So they, I was able to like explore this curiosity of like, what, what might this career look like when I was 15? And by the end of the year, I was like, I don't really want to do this, but it was such a gift to be able to explore that curiosity of mine. And, and we did this for like every student in the building. Like we had a student who also wanted to be a like marine biologist. They're not a marine biologist today, they're a pastry chef. But they got to figure out when they were in high school, oh, I actually like don't wanna go into marine biology. I, I like need to go to culinary school. Um, so that was kind of the third gift of that education experience. So I knew at the time that I really wanted to go into social entrepreneurship. I knew that's where I belonged um, by the time I had graduated high school because I had had a space and a container um, to really explore what was curious um, and interesting to me. And so when I think about the future of higher ed, I work now in social and emotional learning. I equip um, sixth through 12th grade educators across the country um, with these stress management tools or stress reduction tools. And what I've been learning over time is like social emotional learning doesn't end when we graduate middle school or high school, or even as it doesn't end even as an adult, it's a continuous practice and journey. And so when I think about what I hope for higher education, my hope is that we start offering more opportunities for young people to gain social and emotional skills, that it's not a freshman seminar course, that it is a, a practice that we learn and we continue to be curious about what strategies and practices um, enable us to be more resilient um, and shine as our true selves. And my second you know, hope for higher education is that we connect college students with young people, high school students that ha look like them, that come from similar cultures, backgrounds, gender identities, um, neurodiverse students, like we're all able to connect with people that have a similar lived experience to us. Because I can say that if I wasn't connected to Jamie as a 15 or 13 year old, I would not be able to do the work I'm doing today or go to college, because I just wouldn't have believed it was possible. And so Thank you, Ashoka Yu, for having me tonight. Um, thank you, Lauren, for moderating. Um, that's my spiel. Thank you so much, Tessa. I think you brought up a lot of really important parts about how uh, structural barriers and interpersonal barriers can really undermine not only our confidence, but also our resiliency. Um, and the idea that we need to naturalize these skills um, uh, as an everyday practice is really, really powerful. and um, uh, you're badass. So thanks. <laughs> okay, awesome. Next up, uh, we'd like to introduce Victor Yi, Ashoka Young Changemaker and Social Entrepreneur. He is the founder of Innova Youth, a global education nonprofit, and also founder of Untextbook. Victor believes history is an interdisciplinary subject that can inspire students to engage with trailblazers in present history, rather than viewing it from the sideline as just mere dates and times of the past. And so welcome, Victor. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Lauren, for the introduction. And I am super appreciative and grateful to be part of this panel today. 
Um, I'd love to share my story a little bit more um, and talk about why I'm super passionate about history, civic engagement, social responsibility, and just getting students to dive deeper into their own passion and interest. I, first of all, am a uh, Chinese-born American, uh, first-generation American here in the U.S. My parents came from China. And so growing up, I wasn't able to assimilate very well uh, to particular cultures due to the fact that my parents never really learned to speak English. And so for me, something that I learned from them was the realization that I needed to not only be as productive of a member of society that I needed to be in, but that also I share a lot of my understanding of how as an Asian American, I can best help bridge different identities together. So throughout high school experiences, throughout middle school experiences, I find myself trying to be in leadership capacities and roles and which helped me not only foster connectivity and also inclusion, but also a way for us to bridge all gaps together. Uh, no matter our walks of life, our upbringings, or our backgrounds. The first particular moment that really kind of raised a big, big spark in my passion for storytelling and messaging uh, was in history classes throughout high school, when I realized the big gap there was between getting students to getting students to be inspired by the textbooks themselves and actually just memorizing and regurgitating information. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have similar experiences, but for me, I mostly felt isolated in a classroom in which the history that I was being taught was mostly not what I looked like. Um, and also from the past experiences of facts and data that didn't seem relevant to any of the personal work experiences or particular projects that I was a part of. I know that one particular moment in time was in my European history classroom in sophomore year of my high school year, when we were learning about the French Revolution. And for someone that I was uh, a very, very inclined person when it came to reading global news or searching up current events. At the time and period, I realized that there were so many different mistakes that we were learning in history, but yet not actually repeating them um, is something that I felt that was important. One of the most important uh, particular moments in time in which kind of helped me get through that was during the time in which I was looking up the Venezuelan crisis, in which there were a lot of oppression, a lot of societal issues, problems with economy, uh, people that were living in poverty. And I realized that as privileged Americans here, we really have the idea of learning about education and history from data and facts, but not actually being able to provide solutions and actually problem solving methods to the most challenging problems of our century. And so actually being in the history classroom, I asked my teacher how we can best utilize the facts and data and information that we learned from these textbooks inside the classroom experience to actually best foster our creativity and our passions to actually solve these particular issues, like those that are overseas or issues such as environmental sustainability or mental wellness or anything related to that. And my teacher told me that I, number one, um, was not, you know, someone that was old enough to solve those issues. And number two, that because they were not part of the curriculum, that I didn't really need to learn it, um, and that it was not being tested for. So I could rely on those that were generations beyond me that were solving those issues. And from that time forward, I realized that there was a big need and importance to stress when it came to students actually fostering, fostering the creativity and passions beyond the classroom experience where if they loved environmental sustainability and love to work in conservation, that they didn't just need to sit in the biology classroom and just memorize information about cells or molecular structures or just build models, but that actually they can actually go into their classrooms and communities and actually create a systemic issue for themselves that could be solved for them. And so that's when I created the nonprofit Innova Youth, which is a global education nonprofit geared to help students start their own social impact projects, and we hosted conferences around the idea of civic engagement so that we can get students to actually think more beyond their school capacity. So many students love solving problems, but the schools aren't fostering that creativity or innovation or inspiration for students to actually dive deeper into what they believe their role could be in society. And so I started off as someone that was a 15 year old trying to realize that this was a community initiative where we were all we were trying to do was ensure that if I loved going into politics, or if I loved going to be in environment or any other particular subject that I can actually dive deeper and I should not be stuck and, um, you know, someone that was just only relevant within the four classroom walls of our school. And so I started first hosting various small workshops here and there in regards to social innovation, about strategy, about how to create a project that would be bigger than yourself. And it was just something that I aimed to do just to get my students 
at my school more involved. Two years later, I saw myself exponentially ex increasing and expanding the organization to new heights, where we ended up expanding to about a dozen countries where we were hosting conferences from places in Los Angeles, all the way to places in Iran and United Arab Emirates in places in Syria, Lebanon. And what I realized from that particular experience was that every young person was super, super motivated to actually change their society for the better. And it only required one young person or another person to motivate them and inspire them and let them know that there's a big issue when it came to getting young people to start working and start figuring out their passions to a deeper level. And from that instance, I realized that there's so much for us to discover when it came to higher education, for us not to just be stuck into the academics or the work in which provided a th the intellectual information, but actually it gave us the opportunity to dive deeper and figure out that, you know, we can actually start our roles as citizens of the world and also people that are not only thinking globally, but actually acting locally. And throughout those experiences, I started other projects along the, along the way as well, through my passion for history, when I started the podcast Untextbooked, which aimed to reshape the way that history is being taught inside the classroom experience by inviting podcasters that were ages 16 to 18 from across the United States to interview authors and historians about topics that were not being seen in those history textbooks. From, his, from topics just like history of food, all the way to talking about pirates and democracy, all the way to talking about what the American dream actually meant for 21st century citizens. And so throughout these important discoveries, I realized that students like myself aren't actually that special. Everyone is someone that can be inspired. Any person can really make a difference, especially in their communities and actually increase their impact and footprint by realizing that everyone has a mutual understanding for being with each other and providing a better world for everyone. And so whether that is mental well-being or support or actually working together side by side, even though we are from different walks of life or different ethnicities or different diverse backgrounds, that we can actually make a difference in strengthening American democracy and providing ourselves with the best moments in time um, to utilize our productivity. And throughout that experience, it takes me here where I am on my gap year before heading to the University of Southern California to study international relations and economics. And I hope that throughout my discoveries in university and also beyond that, I can really provide my experiences of working in social entrepreneurship, nonprofit organizations, and as well as civic engagement and social responsibility to best enhance my skills to help others make a change in their differences and their communities. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, thank you, Victor, so much. Uh, I am seeing there's an ongoing theme here of folks being discouraged from doing this work or to um, uh, exploring opportunities. And I'm really glad that that uh, both you and Tessa didn't listen <laughs> uh, as you're always old enough and capable enough of making change and, and exploring the possibilities. Um, I also wanted to note that uh, the work you're doing is so important as history uh, is an act of public memory that shapes how we understand both cultures and our identities and uh, taking a historical perspectives often prevents us from understanding and addressing the roots of social problems. And so um, what incredible work you're doing to empower those to look back in order to look forward and to do so from a transnational perspective. So thank you so much. I'd now like to introduce our third speaker. Our third speaker is Nora Garcia, a master storyteller and redesigner for justice. Nora is a recent graduate of Washington University in St. Louis and a, master's, uh, and a master in social work. Uh, oh, sorry, I got a little mixed up. Nora uh, uh, is currently a Seeds of Power Fellow at the Creative Reaction Lab and works to train youth alumni of Creative Reaction Lab programs to become co-facilitators of leaders for community action and equity workshops. Please welcome Nora to the stage. Thank you. Yeah, these are a lot of great, you know, I, I love to hear everyone's perspective on this and seeing what brought them here. Um, and going along with the theme, not purpose, like on purpose, but you know, I guess all the stories align. Um, so a little bit about me, I will start from the beginning and thinking about higher education, then after and how that influenced the way that I see that I saw the world and kind of some of the things that I brought to it. So I am a first generation US American. I'm a first generation college student, um, the same as Victor. Um, and Victor mentioned his parents or they, cause I don't know your pronouns, Victor, but I'll say they for now. Uh, Victor's parents um, didn't speak 
English. And I think that was something that was also very familiar to me. My parents didn't speak English. And so I had to navigate a lot of the waters on my own um, to some extent because of that. And so in high school, I remember I also come from a historically underinvested neighborhood. So we didn't have a lot of resources. Um, colleges were a conversation, but mostly reserved for those who were like the top whatever academically I will say um, and I was one of those people who a lot of people took interest in and helped me and mentored me in a lot of ways um, to get me to higher education and so when I did arrive um, to college it was a very different experience because one no one had done it um, two my parents weren't necessarily familiar with the way in which higher education is structured like what is FAFSA right something as simple as that like figuring all of these things out that I wasn't aware of and they weren't aware of. And so figuring out how to maneuver that. Um, during my time in college, my first year, my dad got deported. And I remember for me that being a very pivotal moment in terms of really starting to see this idea of tokenizing students in the sense that, you know, coming there, I had came through a program that was for first generation college students. I was in a, um, a college that was, you know, catered to helping me to some extent, but not necessarily understanding the full scope of what that means, right? So what does it mean when, for example, myself, I have a parent who my freshman year gets supported and I have family members that aren't really sure how to deal with this. I don't have the funds. I don't have the resources to maybe be in a college space, right? Because I think about the mental um, drain that that took for me, like being in classes and also having to deal with a lot of things that traditionally not everyone in the school was dealing with. And so I think for me during that time, I started to understand, okay, I see that there in higher education, there's this talk about diversity and this talk about bringing experiences and um, bringing experiences that are different than the ones that we are accustomed to, but not enough resources to be able to accommodate to those experiences or to be able to help people through that, right? And during my time there, I started to see that I developed a lot of anxiety. I was having panic attacks because I was trying to figure out like how to pay my rent how to do this, how to still be in school. And I think for me, thinking about too, um, one of the things that was really different about my situation is that I was really high functioning. And so I did very, I was doing very well academically. I, you know, was doing well in my classes. And so to the naked eye, people would say, look at this, this person is doing great. And to this day, I think that that's the narrative of like, look, you made it out of this community that otherwise is, X, Y, and Z, right? We've heard the narratives before. And a lot of the times people don't take the time to really see what's going on outside of what is um, visible to the eye. And because of that, I ended up going um, to pursue my bachelor, I mean, my master's in social work because I was working with a lot of first-generation college students who had also experienced a lot of similar things. We're going through a lot of personal um, hardships that they had to overcome while being in the place that was new, right? Like we are first generation college students. No one's ever done this. We don't really know how to do that. And I will say that in higher education, I was really fortunate to be in a program that did assist me with a lot of the academic side um, and resources and things like that. And so I was able to maneuver that easier. But I think about the mental health and a lot of the social components that played into that and how hard it was to figure out, like outside of us talking to one another, how do we create a space where this doesn't happen to someone else, right? Where someone isn't having panic attacks every two seconds or anxiety every two seconds, but unable how to talk to other people about it because I don't know how to address this or I don't know what it is that should be communicated in a space that doesn't feel like I'm just kind of giving like trauma porn, which is like, I'm giving you all my trauma, but there's nothing that's being changed. So when I went to get my um, master's in social work, I had really, I was really focused on structural systems and youth and how do we create these spaces to help them essentially helping pass me. And in that, I found that there were a lot of things that weren't aligning. So I went to a school that was focused on equity work. Um, and at the time, my dad had tried to come back to the United States because he had lived here before he was supported. 
for 40 years. And so it was a really hard transition. And so I was dealing with that during my first year. And again, economic stuff, because I was the first and I didn't really know how to maneuver that space. And during that time, I recall having a conversation with faculty explaining my situation and a lot of it being like, I'm so sorry to hear that, which is great, but saying, well, we can't necessarily change everything for you because that is not um, equitable, right? And if we look at terms, equitable means that you're gonna shift and change what needs to be shifted and changed to accommodate to the experience of that person to ensure that they also have a successful finish, right? As opposed to everybody else. So they can have all the resources, all the space, everything that they need. Right. And I think what they were trying to say is it's, it's not like an equality thing, which is everyone getting the same kind of things um, to make sure you're here. Right. Thinking like, oh, well, the statement was enough. We got you here. So that should be helpful. Um, and so I say all of this to say because I like to bring my story to the forefront, because I think that that kind of transition into the kind of work that I wanted to do because I did see in higher education that there was a very big gap in what was said and what was done, right? So a lot of the times I would see that people had, and that's saying that they had bad intentions. I really don't think that was the case. I think there were a lot of good intentions coming in. I think, however, because people didn't have those lived experiences, it was hard to conceptualize what that experience could be like for me, right? And thinking about shifting of power. And so now I'm kind of transitioning into what I see it. Um, thinking of how that could have shifted, right? If someone would have said, what, did it, what is it that you need? Let me provide those spaces for you so that you can have that, so that you can get to wherever it is you need to get to in a way that feels safe for you. And in, in a way that emotionally you don't feel scarred, you don't suffer more trauma, you don't suffer things that are going to harm you in the long run. And so all of that, to say that um, that led me to Creative Reaction Lab, where we focus on black and brown youth and figuring out like, what do you need, right? Like, I'm not gonna come in here and make assumptions as to what your journey is like, as to what your experience is like, as to what it is that I think you need, right? Like asking them um, and providing the spaces and the opportunities and the funds and whatever it is that they need to get from point A to point B, to make sure that their journey is theirs and not a representation of what we think that they should experience and what their journey should be. Um, I think that's close to, yeah, yeah, 50 years, that's a long time. I think I always say in the, the very close future because I think there's a lot of things that have to be dismantled. I think the higher education in 50 years would be great if the whole system of higher education would be torn down and restarted from the ground up to really accommodate youth. Um, and the only way that they could do that is to create a system alongside youth, right, with equal power so that that's what it looks like. And so that would say 50 years. I think that's very optimistic, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's a little bit about me. I hope I didn't bring the mood too down. And I'll turn it over to you, Lauren. Thanks. You definitely didn't bring the mood down. Um, I just wanted to say like what a wealth of knowledge you bring into the space. And I really want to recognize the difficulties of receiving care when you're in an institution um, where you're underrepresented, underserved, and also marginalized, and then at the same time I'm functioning. And I think that often leads to people not believing you, right? And not believing your experience and, and not responding to it in, in a way that shows like compassion or is justice seeking. And so I know I myself are I'm very much committed to the call for more compassionate educators who live their values. And um, when you're talking about that, that really brought up the idea for me how people will often in their roles uh, talk about, for example, supporting racialized students, uh, but only engage with that when they're in a position of power, right? When they're getting paid as a faculty member or they're doing a program out of the institution and they aren't skilling themselves up, they're not getting those tools in their personal lives, right? They don't have any friends that are racialized. They're not. Um, really in community and so what can it mean to start to shift that and then how do we position people um, I went to your previous talk and how can we uh, examine power for good and, and reposition people to have access to that so thank you so much all right and last uh, but definitely not least I'd like to welcome Samantha Flanor a senior program coordinator at Phyllis M Taylor Center at Tulane University 
Samantha's journey with Tulane began as an undergraduate student where she served as the president of the Tulane Black Student Union and chair of the planning committee for the Tulane Black Arts Festival, one of the largest cultural festivals on campus featuring local and national artists. In her current role at Tulane, Samantha uses design thinking methods and social justice strategies to support learners in identifying and leveraging their skills and power to tackle social problems and support sustainable, equitable solutions in their communities. So welcome, Samantha. Hello, thank you so much for that intro and thank you everyone else, um, my co-panelists uh, for sharing your knowledge. I felt so much resonance with everything that has been said. And I am also a fellow first gen um, immigrant. My parents um, immigrated to the US um, in the eighties from Haiti. Um, and my um, their story of immigration is very much tied to my journey, my educational journey. And um, I actually wanna share a quote from a book called Disoriental by Nagar Javadi that she says, to really integrate into a culture, I can tell you that you have to disintegrate first, at least partially from your own. You have to separate, detach, disassociate, and no one who demands that immigrants make an effort at integration would dare look them at the, in the face and ask them to start by making the necessary effort at disintegration. They're asking people to stand atop the mountain without climbing up it first. And um, I share that quote because I think it really relates to my journey um, through education in which I was disintegrating myself, integrating. And then I think through that journey, I found liberation in my education. So um, a little bit more about me. Um, so as I mentioned before, my parents immigrated from Haiti. Um, they came from a very small village um, on the Northwest side. Um, and from a very early age, and I, I can't remember a time when this wasn't pounded into me, that education was important. And it was always an expectation that I would go to college. Um, there was never a doubt in my mind that I would go to college. Um, so I spent a lot of my um, elementary and high school career really trying to ensure that I had all my ducks in a row to um, get into the best college that I could get into. Um, and th that came with a lot of sacrifice from um, not only my parents, but also for me. I feel like my focus was entirely on um, be making my parents proud um, and uh, ensuring that I um, met their expectation and their legacy as people who had never been to college, who had never had the opportunity, who immigrated to a country to ensure that their um, children had the best opportunities and had the full expectation that their children would be able to get whatever they wanted in a country that um, said that they could get whatever they wanted if they worked hard enough. So I worked really hard. Um, and as I was applying for colleges and I eventually got into a college that I wanted to, Tulane University, um, my first kind of hit with reality was the fact that um, Tulane is very expensive. It's a private institution. Um, and I had a really hard time um, finding money to actually attend this college despite getting financial aid from FAFSA, despite getting some merit scholarships. Um, and it was really up to me to figure out how to get into college because my parents had never been through that process. And in their mind, it should be very easy given all the work that, um, that I had put into it. So um, that was kind of like a first kind of like, whoa, like maybe this isn't available to me. Um, this might not be an opportunity that I can actually pursue despite being told by everyone in my family and everyone around me that that was possible just by working hard. Um, but eventually I did get in. Um, and um, I think one of the first things that I noticed when uh, uh, going to Tulane was um, how different it was in reality than it would be in my head. And I think it um, a big part of that is that it was a predominantly white institution and I um, am obviously black. <laughs> and that came with challenges that I had not anticipated. Um, despite many of my friends um, saying like, hey, Sam, you sure about this? Do you know who goes to Tulane? Um, and I was like, no, it's fine. Like, you know, like 
I um, interact with all kinds of people. It doesn't really matter. But I think um, in a university setting when you're so far away from home, when I was so far away from home, not seeing people who looked like me was definitely a surprise and it was a shock. Um, and I think that was a period in which um, I started um, really trying to figure out where, what my place was, where did I belong? What did I wanna do? Um, not necessary, and seeing ed higher education as something beyond um, something I needed to attain to, um, you know, get the status um, needed to survive in the US. Um, I also grew up um, working class, fairly poor. Um, and this was also an opportunity to attain like the social and economic um, status um, that I had always dreamed of and I had always dreamed of for my family. But um, as I was not seeing people who looked like me, it felt very foreign. It felt like maybe this wasn't the option that I should have taken, that maybe I should not have been there. Um, and um, I was really lucky to um, finally bump into other people who looked like me and felt the way that I did. Um, if it wasn't for the community that I found with other Black students, other immigrant students, first-gen students, um, I definitely wouldn't be here um, talking to you all. And I wouldn't feel like higher education was a space for me. Um, and it wasn't until I actually graduated that I really um, started to deeply investigate the ways in which uh, historically and structurally um, Tulane wasn't built for me. Um, actually, Tulane uh, was founded by people who did not want Black people there. It was um, founded to educate white persons in the city of New Orleans and for the advancement of their learning and letters. Um, so I think really reckoning with the history that I was entering um, was really profound. It was actually really liberating and understanding that I had made it and navigated a space that was literally built for other people and had been um, explicit in excluding people who looked like me um, from its doors. Um, so uh, and I think I was able to do that while I was on campus as well. So in finding other Black people, I was able to um, participate in a community of care. Um, I became the president of Black Student Union. And um, in that position, I really made sure to create community with people across gender, across sexualities, across race. Um, to bring people together to um, create art, to um, show the larger Tulane community and New Orleans community that, they, that we were here, that we were there to learn, to participate, um, that we weren't going anywhere and we were going to make space in spaces that had um, been fairly devoid of um, creating space for us. Um, so that's kind of how the um, Black Student Union um, uh, participated um, in those ways in creating liberating liberating spaces for a, a lot of people on campus. Um, and I think the value of uh, being the Black Arts Chair was that I was able to go to other groups like um, the Queer Student Alliance and um, the um, Muslim uh, Student uh, Alliance and to the Jewish students and say, hey, like, how can we really um, find alignment in our community so that we can share the knowledge and um, the things that we have to offer in a really big way? Um, so that was really exciting. And um, I really appreciated those opportunities. Um, I also think this question around like who is edu higher education for um, is a really hard question to answer because like I mentioned, um, a lot of the institutions that we are a part of um, were not made for a lot of people. Um, higher education in general um, actually celebrates and find success in excluding people. Acceptance rates, the lower they are, the better the school is. Um, so I think for me, a question that I would like to investigate more is um, how can higher education institutions create space 
for people who want to pursue higher education? How can um, we uh, build policy and processes to ensure that people, whoever they may be, whoever comes through these doors are able to find space and share knowledge and exchange care with each other um, in their most authentic selves where they don't feel the need to disintegrate. Um, and that is something that I'm really excited about, um, radically collaborating and imagining those spaces, um, how we can get there closer um, now, what are the steps and the mindsets that we have to take on now to ensure that that happens um, in the next year, in the next 10 years, 20 and then 50 years. Um, and I think the challenges that have really um, kept me from thriving in higher education spaces um, for the most part has been um, when I didn't feel like I could be authentic, when I didn't feel like I could be my full self, um, even when I didn't know who my full self was. Um, Giving, giving permission to investigate and think about those things is so important. Um, and to do that in community, not only with people who look like me, but with people who don't look like me um, and do that journey together. So um, I want to just leave it at that. And I'm excited to just continue this conversation um, with everyone. Thank you so much, Samantha. I really appreciate um, the idea you brought up around, uh, or the disruption that you brought up around education as an equalizer and that education can be an equalizer, but many educational institutions are not still. Um, and that so many barriers continue to permeate these experiences. And um, it's often up to those people to find communities that are able to become skilled in responding to injustice through um, lots of different means, creativity, empathy, optimism. So that's so important. Thank you. So now um, I'm just uh, gonna call uh, back all the panelists if you wanted to turn your cameras on um, and we're gonna engage in more of a dialogue. Uh, today we talked about quite a few themes. A lot of folks talked about finding community, creating sites of resistance and, and finding spaces that didn't exist before, um, particularly around um, the seeking of equity, uh, diversity, inclusion and justice in the spaces that they were looking at. And so I just wanted to give our panelists an opportunity to respond to each other if there was something that you found that was really interesting or uh, that you wanted to follow up on? I can follow up on some thoughts that I <laughs> had. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think just going back to um, kind of the, the reckoning, the historical reckoning that a lot of these institutions need to go through in order to um, move forward is an interesting concept. Um, like I mentioned before, um, my university has a history of um, excluding and was founded on exclusion um, uh, by people who were actually part of the Confederacy. Um, and that was never part of the history that's written down on any website, or I can't quickly Google that. Um, I imagine my parents, had they known that, would not be so thrilled about sending their child to a space that um, was founded on such values. And um, there is a history of um, civil rights and liberation in these spaces. Uh, and those are also stories that I often don't hear about. So um, I'm just thinking about like just um, last year was the 30th anniversary of ADA compliance in a lot of spaces. Um, I don't hear that history a lot and that is a win. Um, and that's not to say that we are where we need to be, but until we, start talking about what has happened, what was done, and um, what momentum we can kind of hop onto so that we can move forward. Um, I think we'll be moving a lot slower than we should be. Thank you, Samantha. I think taking account of those histories is really important. And I know that a lot of folks right now are exploring the endowment funds of their institutions or the, the programs that uh, that supported the voices of, of scholars or, or professionals that um, reproduced 
a lot of really problematic or harmful or violent uh, scholarship or are looking into how, um, for example, uh, um, opportunities that they offered might have been ableist or racist or, or uphold uh, forms of colonial violence. And so I think that that becomes really important. And I think some of the work that um, Victor is doing is, is really looking at that and looking at um, uh, bringing us into a a clear picture of those things. And so I would encourage folks to start there. <laughs> I think that would be a great place to start is understand what has happened. Yeah, and anyone else like to add? I think one of the things that just pops up is thinking also the role that we all play. And when I say that, I mean like every single one of them in holding up certain institutions or holding on this idea of what higher education is. Um, and I think I say that because I, every time I think about it, right, like the term expertise, that's something that bugs me because that's also playing. And I think it's okay to have studied and have knowledge about things because I love learning, right? But I always think about automatically, even if you are having a conversation with someone, let's say a student, and automatically that's like, oh, I'm a doctor of this, or like small things, right? And like how we are playing into this idea that there has to be a hierarchy or that there is certain things that are tradition right, without necessarily thinking about the harm that that's done, whether in the context of higher education and even outside, right, like, how have titles been used to, like, oppress other people, or how has that been used as a tool to exclude people from spaces, right, like, oh, you don't have the credentials, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, like, I know, I went there, and I say that as someone who went to graduate school, right, like, and don't, that's why I'm always asking, like, what are you, I'm not going to give you the answers, because that's, I can't give that for everyone. And so just thinking about that, um, I think it's also important, like what role do we all play? Thank you for that. I think that that's um, such a important perspective and how those of us who might access institutional expertise uh, need to take a step back and question that expertise <laughs> a lot of the times. And then also those of us who, who might not um, uh, should take a step forward. And that uh, I think a lot of thought feminist scholars talk about this when they say like theory comes from the streets, right? Theory is of the people. And it actually, it's really important that it comes from community. Um, so, and it does. So thank you for that. Okay. Uh, so we can move into some questions. Uh, we got asked, um, uh, the first question is, if you were dean for a day, uh, I really hope that you all become deans, <laughs> if, that, if you would like to have that in your journey. Um, but what is your number one priority uh, for the institution uh, that you would be the dean of? I implore you to imagine an institution that is um, maybe outside of an institution that you currently exist in and that you can be as imaginative as you would like. I can start because I often think about this. <laughs> um, if I were dean for a day, I think I would um, start just like combing through policies and start ensuring that these processes and rules um, were equitable as possible. I'm still shocked by um, the amount of barriers that are placed. Um, and then um, when a new person comes in, how quickly they are removed once they make that a priority. Um, so I think I would just start there, start going through the rule books, making sure that um, folks are able to access the um, information, knowledge, spaces they need to thrive. Thank That's you. Somebody. I know. Um... Oh, yeah, go ahead, Victor. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just want to say, Samantha, that's an amazing answer. I appreciate you kind of talking about that. Um, I know that like the one thing that popped into my brain was more student town halls, more student participation, more of active engagement and responsibility between inter, uh, intergenerational communication when it comes to people that run our institutions versus those who are attending our institutions. And at the end of the very day, uh, the stakeholders themselves are the students themselves that make their own time useful at the university experience. Uh, so being able to provide more spotlight, more attention to jump onto various committees or boards or various particular ways of involvement that allow students to realize that 
The university, after all, is transparent in every single way in their resources and the ability to ensure the success of all individuals together um, with equal opportunity and equality on both sides as well. That would allow us to thrive and be able to explore whatever we would like to do at a deeper level. So that's something that I would um, say if I were um, ever a dean. Victor, that's exactly where my mind went as well. I've had the gift of working with the Colorado Youth Congress and the students, they run the Colorado Youth Congress. Like they are fully in charge. And so when I think about being a dean for, a de for the day, like listening to students, but how do you create an environment and asking myself this question and asking the students this question and, and the, the whole community, like how do we create an environment where students are leading the way? Because it's ultimately, it's their education. Um, and they know what they want and need. We just need to listen and act on it. So that's where I would start. So Victor and Samantha, brilliant. I was gonna say, I agree. You guys took it out of my mouth. I was thinking about that. I think the first thing that I would do is one, listen to everyone's story. And what I mean story is like having a space to really get to know who's in the room, what experiences are in the room like what life journeys are here because I think too often and I think that's a problem in higher education we're just another number usually right students like another number and so it's easy to put off and be like well I ain't got no emotional attachment so you know we got 20 we got 50 whatever and so I think the first thing is to really create that space so everyone does feel like they're part of this and then piggybacking on what was said about thinking about like how do we like what can we do right together to create the space that you need because I'm not here to come up with that. Like, I'm not a magician. So what do you guys need? Because I don't know. Um, and so I always think that's important. But thinking about like the stories, I think we don't do that often. We go to spaces, we say, hey, bye, great to meet you. You're just so cute. And we don't really know much outside of the more surface level things that we see. Thank you, folks. I think a lot of the issues that you folks brought up and things you'd like to see about like lack of transparency and not revising policies and not having students in leadership and not telling stories um, is often because we consider the student population transient and we are not really prepared to dive that deep. And so I think like setting us up for success to like really bring students into that, bring students into that conversation from day one will be so important. And I know um, Tessa, you talk a lot about students um, uh, in the elementary school system and how it can start there, right? So thank you. Um, we have the next question. Uh, so much of higher education and society is centered around traditional hierarchical and white dominant definitions of success. How would you redefine what a successful graduate looks like? I'd love to start. Uh, I think Thanks. when I think about what a successful graduate looks like, it kind of thinks, I kind of think back on how we can better be global citizens at the end of the day uh, when it comes to our role and ensuring that society continues to flourish in a way that is uh, equitable for all people. Um, so when we are looking at that, we're not looking at the amount of expertise or I guess the academic particular intellect that we develop during our time in university, but actually rather the uh, skills that we can give back the most, the ones that are the most philanthropic, the ones that are able to give you know, other people the opportunities and chances. I think that's how we can deliver the best success is if we pave the road forward for those who need it the most. And so success maybe just looks like those who really can continue to bring forth their own particular talents or their own passions or interests to other individuals in order to continue this motion of cycle of people that continue to thrive and really realize that they themselves have the power to um, be the person in control of their own lives. Were you folks trying to decide who goes next? I, I, I feel like I saw Nora go and then I am, and we just kind of did this dance. Um, so I think to just first defining what success looks like at a university now, it's um, high grades and achieving over others. Um, and I think just to subvert that, I'd, I'd love to see um, success be achieving um, not only with your in, in and of yourself, but also achieving with others and um, having participated in a community of care um, and uh, participating in the success of others as well. So um, I don't know exactly what that would look like um immediately in my mind because of like just what I've been exposed to that sounds like a lot of group projects but I don't think it has to be 
I think one of the things that comes to mind, and I stop because I, I don't know how to frame this, but I think um, a successful graduate, and I think just a human, is someone who's able to stand in their power, whatever that looks like. I think too often we don't think about that. We kind of cruise through a lot of stuff. And I think that providing spaces that really allow people to explore who they are, right? Even if it's like just the, the first layer of that, but providing a space that feels comfortable to do that kind of work and to really um, go through life in a way that feels authentic to them. I think that that is one of the ways that I would envision that, which is really hard because I feel like it's abstract, but I think that that is one of the things that would be beneficial. And I didn't really touch on my higher education experience, um, but I went to the Watson Institute at Lynn University and they, they're they so really focused on social entrepreneurship. Um, and it goes to Samantha's point, when I think back of like what makes that community successful is that there is care that like we all succeed or no one succeeds. Like, and I, and I can't really name like what exactly, like how we exactly cultivated that as a community but I know that's our feeling like as as we we're undergraduate students and as alumni, there is this um, sense of success that we're we're in it for each other um, and that we have each other's backs. And so I think like redefining success is that we have these communities of care. Um, I think, Nora, you said like that that's inevitably in there. And so I think the other component of that is people that are resilient and know how to think and, and know how to navigate challenges and obstacles and feel confident in their ability to do that, that to me would be success. And thank you, Bita, for that question. Amazing, thank you folks. I think a lot of you folks were sort of calling attention to some of the ideas around mutual aid and the idea that everyone has needs and also everyone has something to give um, and, and that a lot of our learning can be done in service of others, right? And, and with others, so thank you for that. So we have about five minutes left before we wrap up, uh, but there was one more question that was offered into the space. Um, and the question <laughs> is probably my favorite. Um, if we don't pivot now, what will be the death of higher ed? And so quickly before we wrap up, uh, if we don't make these changes, what will, what will be the death of higher education? Um, I feel like I'm already seeing this kind of um, thread of feeling like higher education is um, irrelevant, not helpful, um, just another hurdle that people need to get through in order to attain success in this in in most places in society. Um, and if we don't pivot now, the the lived experiences, the knowledge of people who do make our institutions so full, diverse, and um, amazing, they'll leave um, and they'll do something else. And um, maybe they'll let us into that club, but I don't know, <laughs> right? So I think um, the, the time to pivot um, is happening. And I think also recognizing that a lot of there are institutions that came out of that pivot. I think um, the work that community colleges have done is amazing. And that's a huge pivot. Um, historically black colleges was a pivot. They made space um, for people who had been excluded. Um, so I, I just wanna recognize those spaces that have, have been doing the work and it's time for a lot of our research institutions, our four year traditional institutions institutions to start looking um, to the places that have come out of struggle um, for knowledge and um, for guidance. Noren, um, I've been intentionally keeping myself quiet so I can really hear the stories of our wonderful panelists. But while we're on this very last question, which I'd like to chime in just very briefly, um, I guess gets to the prior point I made. What's the soul or the hearts of American higher education? If you know what world is changing constantly, let's ask the question: What's not changed? What's the constant? What's really the essence of higher education institution? That's is very important part of the society here. So if you remember what I shared about Parker Palmer. So we're actually losing the soul and the heart of education. 
I, I don't I don't have an answer. I just feel fascinating thinking about uh, what, what we cannot afford to keep losing is that exactly that. One of my favorite uh, pioneer education pioneer for progressive education, John Dewey, in his famous quote about the purpose of education is to instill the seeds of democracy into the mind and heart of a young person. And he also said, John Dewey, if I may quote again, education is not a preparation for life. Education is life itself. So there is a life in education. So I guess the purpose of education is really not equipping us to have a, you know, you know that's partially you know, for a better job or for a better life and all that, but rather enjoy the education as a part of the life. I, I don't know what, what's the best message I can send you guys off is, um, we talk about transformative power. It is within the deep listening and through the life story that we have to share with each other. I, I guess I, if I may quote Parker, which is a close friend, I love what he said. And uh, he was interviewed one day on community, how he sees community, the roles of community. If I may quote again, I love him, so I, I, I can remember that literally. Community is a place where the connections fell in our hearts, make themselves known in the bounds between people and where the tuggings and the pullings of those bounds kept opening our hearts. Can you, can you understand? Can you understand the moving, the tugging and the pulling of those bounds? Come with the conflict, come with debate, but we never lose the, the kind of the agreement to disagree with each other in a, in a higher education institution setting, but it's the bound that we build with each other as part of our life. I, I just found this panel to be fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you so much. Um, powerful words. Um, I'm wondering if folks wanted to, to add their two cents before we wrap up. Is anyone passionate about talking a little bit more about what it would mean to pivot at this time or if not pivot uh, towards um, change in higher ed? Okay. Um, if folks uh, are feeling like um, uh, this may be not be a question that they're uh, ready or, or wanting to answer, that's totally okay. Um, what I'll do then is I'll just wrap up the conversation and wanted to say uh, that I really hope this conversation uh, for those who are listening, that it planted some seeds of thought or, or served as a useful reminder um, uh, that can move us into new forms of action. And I would like to thank the panelists, uh, Tessa, Victor, Nora, and Samantha for the space that they've held today, their leadership, expertise, and the hope <laughs> that you folks have shared with us. And um, I'd also like to thank the Ashoka U Exchange team who have, without a doubt, uh, created opportunities for us to learn and practice how to live in our values. So um, I'm gonna uh, uh, do something a little cheesy and, and use a really popular quote right now, but to quote Nelson Mandela, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And I truly believe that. So thank you everybody for, for your contributions and I hope everyone stays safe. Um, and for those who celebrate St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> uh, I hope you're having a wonderful St. Patrick's Day and I'll pass it back to Erin. <laughs> All right, I just, sitting here thinking about um, how it's so appropriate that the Fetzer Institute brought us together for this closing keynote today that um, Fetzer reminds us all that together we can build a foundation for a more loving world. And so all of the strategies that I've heard from these panelists are exactly that, um, that strategy to th think about how can we talk to the next generation? How can we see from the student perspective what the future of higher education can be? So just what an honor. Thanks everyone for this panel. And we have plenty of sessions lined up for tomorrow um, that we'll dive into you know, how this can be done leading towards our final keynote that will be Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern um, time. So this concludes our keynote today and looking forward to seeing everyone tomorrow. Thanks.